Um, yes, we, we are talking about uh, a conflict that has taken that has been taking place for a long time. It is in essence, in, in its essence, a, a zero sum conflict. But the resolution for the conflict that is out there, which now we have international consensus around, is not a a, uh, a zero sum solution. There is an actual potential win win solution out there that more and more people around the world, including Israel and Palestine, are are buying into. Um, we're talking about a political agreement with uh, with international guarantees that will will uh, uh, bring about uh, an end to claims, um, but not necessarily to a real reconciliation. And I think that we should not be seeking at this point an actual reconciliation between the, the, the parties. In other words, the parties will not give up their historic narrative. They will give up exercising the historic narrative. And the reason I think it's important to uh, emphasize this point here is that what we, what we see, uh, Light and I see it all the time when we go to university campuses, many times uh, the discussion about Israeli-Palestinian affairs on campuses evolves around the historic narrative, with very little attention being given to how we can actually depart from that in order to be um, constructive and, and pragmatic and seek and, and, and kind of forward leaning, future leaning, if you will, and seek a, a resolution from that narrative. Um, and I think that one of the things that you'll be hearing today, maybe a theme, maybe the theme, is that uh, in order for us to be uh, pragmatic and constructive and so on, we have to depart from insisting on a full exercising of the historic narrative without giving it up. I'm not saying that any of the parties should give up uh, their historic uh, narratives. What we'll suggest, I think, is that is that uh, uh, maybe counterintuitively, the places where you'd expect people to be the more the most progressive university campuses uh, on Israel-Palestine, the discussion tends to be the most regressive because it's so anchored in the past and so um, uh, resistant sometimes to be forward-leaning and to focus on the future. What are some of the lessons that I've learned? As a former negotiator, negotiator, I used to be a negotiator in the 90s and beginning of the century, in some of the negotiation sessions, what are some of the lessons that I have learned? That I will start looking and seeing if some of these are being applied. The first I would say is the lesson that uh, this conflict is resolvable, which is not something to take for granted. We know what the solution, what the conflict uh, more or less looks like. At least we know the menu of options and we know it's resolvable. Very, very briefly, and I'm more than happy to go into details later on. Two states along the 1967 borders, Jerusalem will have to be divided, and that is probably the toughest thing for Israelis, and possibly for Jews throughout the world, dividing Jerusalem. Yet, if you want peace, then uh, Jerusalem has to be the capital of uh, both states. For the Palestinians, the bitter pill that they have to swallow is the issue of the refugees, an understanding that uh, there will be no exercise of their terror rights in terms to Israel. Israel was created for one reason alone, to be the homeland of the Jewish people. And all of you who are familiar with the history of the Jewish people can understand why uh, there is a need for a homeland. And so this is what the Palestinians would have to accept. If you want peace, if you want a state, and if you want independence, we have to give up on the exercise of the right of return. Uh, it is counterintuitive and in some ways annoying. You know, we in D.C. like to think of ourselves as conservative, behind the curve, deliberating everything. And we like to think of campuses as where, you know, new progressive ideas are happening. Well, on our issue, it's not, it's not the case. Here in this town, you can be pro-Palestine, pro-Israel, center, center-left, center-right, and we call it all interact. Why? Because we know that we have a common goal, a two-state solution. And therefore, if you have a common goal, you have uh, something to be partners on. Sadly, on many campuses, not on all, and it'd be interesting to examine some of the different, some of the models which are, you know, an exception. Yet on most campuses, it's all about divisiveness, it's all about who can outbid the other, it's all about who can throw the, you know, most exaggerated uh, adjectives uh, to the other, and, you know, it might feel good to kind of, I showed them, I, uh, you might go home and feel good about yourself, that you've you know, proved your point, but then what? Where does this take us? Where does this take our leaders who are putting their, you know, credibility on the line in this country and elsewhere for this? 
I think this is the time for us to actually look inwards and think, why are we in this? What do we want? Do we want to make a point or do we want to change reality? So again, our, our theme here today is creating safe spaces um, for an honest, balanced dialogue on campus. Um, I think building on what Guy was saying and what Ori, the background that they're talking about with negotiations likely to be resumed soon, um, I think we all know that what happens then is people here start paying more attention. When people pay more attention, their passions are inflamed, and I think we'll all see the effect of that on campus. To me, I don't think, <laughs> just like uh, I think, I think an honest, balanced discussion means not being afraid to discuss any of the issues, not having to uh, equivocate with everything that you say, you know, uh, being able to, to really uh, express your personal connection to Israel or Palestine, why you care about it, um, even to tell stories of how your family was affected, if you have relatives there, if, they, you, know, if you have uh, people who were killed in the conflict, um, being able to talk with others without it rising to a shouting match. Um, there's a need to listen, because what happens is often when you get into debates, when you get into conversations, it's about what the person thinks and then why they think it. But maybe those two, that's, it's not that binary, sometimes how they came to the conclusion is more important than what they think and why they think it. So when you have these discussions, this uh, quote-unquote balanced and, and more reasonable discussion on the conflict, sometimes taking a step back and going, I know I disagree with this opinion, but how they got there, maybe it's it was enlightening for me when I talked to people who I disagree with, uh, because it, it calms me down, and it's, it doesn't become a, a confrontation. Coming from an MSA perspective, I, it's sometimes challenging to, you know, if I go and do a Palestine awareness week, but what am I, you know, it automatically becomes the antithesis to the Israeli awareness week. But that's not getting you anywhere. And so I was, I was curious what, what, what people's thoughts were about this issue, about these awareness weeks, and, and are they actually there to compete with one another, to provide, uh, you know, a contra, uh, conflicting narratives, or can they be used actually in a more productive way? And I think it would probably be more helpful to have, or at least helpful in understanding the basis of the conflict to have, kind of focus more on cultural identities and kind of, you know, this is who the Palestinian people are and this is who the Israeli people are without talking about, without restricting it to geography and without also making it about conflict. That's not all the Palestinian and Israeli people are, is conflict. That's not what that is at all. Um, you know, you have the week for, you know, we raise awareness for Israel and, you know, the events see and then you have like also the Students for Justice in Palestine week. And those two weeks are just like, who can like, you know, get more people, who can be nastier to each other. Like, I dropped out of Students for Justice in Palestine because their events were, let's have a hunger strike. Um, let's dress up as, you know, prisoners. And what is that going to do? Like, you're just going to, you know, cause more conflict and, you know, groups just like hating each other and all of that. So, and so, one, one thing that I have struggled with, I don't know if anyone has any insight into this, is coming up with language to talk about, well, how can we, how can I be the one um, who's saying that, like, this isn't something that we can agree on, but maybe we can agree on something moving forward, and, like, talk to someone who is so set on coming up with something together to, like, prove a, prove a historical point, um, so that, like, I can run an event with someone who I really disagree with, um, that, that people will still enjoy without actually both of us just standing up there and presenting alternate history. So like, where's the middle ground between like a fake um, combined factual lesson and two distinct but not necessarily like mutually exclusive narratives? So I, I think I might bring us back to what Ori was saying at the very beginning too, to jump off of what Benji's saying, is you might have two extreme viewpoints in terms of history, but you might share the same viewpoint in terms of what you want the future to be. And so I think probably the logical starting point is we can spend months, years, decades arguing about history on campus. It's not going to do anything to get rid of the conflict, which is going to make us hate our classmates. Um, but if we can think, if we agree that we want two states for two people and a just Middle East, then we have something to talk about and we can work, I think, backwards in a way. Um, so I think as a framework, we're probably wrong in terms of strategy when we start from history with disagreement, but we should probably start at a place where we agree, and then I think we don't have extremes anymore. Um, and what I learned is that you can actually find 
common language, even though, even with those who we perceive as extremists. Not with everyone, of course, some of them are just, you know, people who are just completely nuts, regardless of their political opinions. But my feeling sometimes here in the States, though, on the other hand, is that people are just treat the Israel-Palestinian conflict as in some, some sort of intellectual game. Um, and that is something that, as someone who, not even only on Israel, right, but someone who comes from the region, is just hard for me to, to handle. Because I feel like for a lot of uh, people here um, who are on both sides of the aisle, can be um, pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli or pro-whatever they want to be, um, declare that they are pro, they're just, they're, they don't see the people on the ground, they don't really think of, about what are the action that they're doing, how are they progressing, you know, any kind of reality on the ground. Um, a, a quick comment, a, a really great tool, I think, for dealing with uh, uh, extremist views, not the most extremist sometimes, but extremist views, uh, are these booklets that we have there. Uh, they're called They Say, We Say. And um, this is, uh, could, could serve you as a tool in order to counter uh, some of the, of the more extremist uh, views that are being um, uh, voiced on, on, on campuses and beyond, uh, particularly by more, the more hawkish camp. It wasn't really a question of like finding people from the most extremes and teaching them how to talk to each other. It was actually just building more spaces for conversation and finding that there are tons of other people that are interested in this issue that that, are, that, that just flock to those spaces because usually the people who are the, the loudest and present the most extreme positions are also a very small group um, and their voices just drown out all the, you know, what we like to call like the silent majority um, that tends to agree with more moderate positions. So one biggest uh, issue is overgeneralizing and stereotyping the other only because we, we never met. Like, what I, I only know of Israel is their idea of the soldiers, those who come and, and kill my, 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 my relatives and destroy my house, and this is all what I know about Israel. Um, and one of the things I'd say is, there's a very tough balance between having the most experienced person in our organization, or having the person with the most promise to continue the organization, run the organization. So one of the things that we found worked much better than having somebody who is going to be a senior, and we'll have senioritis, and we'll be writing a thesis or looking for a job, and then we'll take their institutional knowledge and leave. You're better off to have a junior involved in running an organization, somebody who's going to be able to then mentor someone else the next year and create an institutional framework. So you, you can have a mentor who isn't necessarily the person in charge, and, and that's very, very helpful. Okay, so I may have an entirely different take on this. Uh, my name is Jojo, by the way, I'm an intern at ATFP. Um, and I go to McGill University. And I'm not remotely involved on campus in the israeli Palestinian conflict. Um, well, I am and I'm not in the sense that I don't affiliate with any specific group because I dislike the sensationalism associated with the conflict. But I will um, help out with events that I find to be educational. And so I guess that's my point. It's, I think the best way to continue the legacy or to leave a legacy on your school or with regards to israeli Palestinian conflict in a whole is not necessarily putting a certain person in the head of a certain group and preserving a certain group, but it's to spread the right kind of ideas and the right kind of message because those are what stay and get talked about and get passed on over time. And so it, it's really about the, the dialogue between you know you and another person and just talking on a real level and how you feel about it and that opens someone up to the possibility of being able to get involved with it on a greater level. So I think that's the most important. Well, if nobody has anything else to say, I just wanted to thank everyone again for coming tonight. Um, stay tuned for more events like these. We'll be KPN and ATFP. We'll be attending a lot in the future. And uh, thanks again to the Washington Center and Andrew Have a good night.